So I am really excited about tonight. Um, it's This has been a remarkable study for me. Um, I usually can get an introduction, a body, and then an ending. But it's like this subject just doesn't end. Now, it's going to end tonight, so don't be afraid. I'm not going to keep you all here forever. Um, but it's just it's just been really wonderful to study this out in the epistle of John and then also everywhere else in Scripture that lays this out. Um, so let me just tell you what we're, what we're doing tonight. So in our last lesson, we introduced um, four marks of a true believer, and John lays that out for us in his epistles. And they're a right view of Jesus, a right view of sin, a right view of obedience, and a right view of love. So that's right view of Jesus, sin, obedience, and love. And last time we were together, we gave gave a lot of diligence to looking at Jesus. Um, We saw His glory, as the Bible clearly demonstrates, that He is uh, the divine logos, which is the Greek word for word, that we see translated in John 1, 1. Uh, He's the only begotten of the Father, uh, and He is the one that is manifest in time from eternity. And it's not just the right view of Jesus that we have to have um, that puts us as members of the body of Christ, um, but it's also these other three parts of the four marks of a true believer. So let's just kind of run through those real quickly here. So you have to have a right view of Jesus... You have to have a right view of sin. You have to have a right view of obedience. And you have to have a right view of love to be saved. Now, you may not have a full understanding and a complete knowledge of all of these things, but you're going to have the right view. And where you find that you contradict that right view, you're willing to abandon your Baptist doctrine. You're willing to abandon... Catholic doctrine, you're willing to abandon Presbyterian, you're willing to abandon everything that man tells you to line up with what God's Word says, so that you can fully be a part of these four marks and see them worked out in your life. So, um, as I said, you might think to yourself, I don't know that I had a full right view of Jesus and love and sin and obedience when I got saved, and you didn't. None of us did. If you had a full understanding of those things, then there would be no need for growth. There would be no need for sanctification. Um, but you you have to have at least a right enough. Uh, let's let's look at it this way. Here's the right view of Jesus in sin, obedience, and love. In Romans chapter ten, I know this is First John. We're going to get to First John, but this is important that we establish this. Paul puts it this way. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession, note that confession, is made unto salvation. For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be what? Ashamed. So when we're born again, he gives us a mouth that proclaims forth our... I don't want to say our pride, but our um, our love and adoration for what He has done. Uh, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So, here's what we find here. At the point of conversion, you confess Jesus as Lord. And not just Lord. Note this. But you confessed Him as Lord of all. He's not just... Lord over your life, but He is Lord of everything. You don't say about Jesus, well, He's my way, but He's nobody else's way. You say Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So you may not have understood what it meant that He is the icone, or icone, the image, as Paul tells us, of the invisible God, which is what he says in Colossians 1.15, but you know that He is You believed in your heart that God raised Him from the dead. It wasn't a mental assent that you just said, well, I'll just agree to these facts, but a heartfelt acknowledgement of the power of the Father to raise the Son. And much more could be said about that, but we don't want to relay the foundation that we laid last time talking about the Lord Jesus. But you suffice it to say that you have to have a right view of Jesus to be saved. And without a right view of sin, 
you can't be saved. Because without a right view of sin, there's no reason for you to call on the name of the Lord in the first place. Why would you call on Him if you don't, have, if you don't understand your sinfulness? That you are sinful. Um, so you acknowledge your sin, and you understood that in your sin you stood condemned before God. But God, who is rich in mercy, we're going to hit that a couple times tonight, He is rich in mercy. He demonstrates His love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And next is right view of obedience. And without that, you wouldn't have called on Him in the first place. I mean, it doesn't matter if you acknowledge your sin without having obedience to the call of the Gospel. Even just acknowledging your sin doesn't get you saved. I talk with people on the street all the time. They're like, I know I'm a bad person. I know. Okay. Where do you go from here? You have to obey the call of the gospel. That's what, that's what you have to have. You have to right view of obedience. That your obedience is not so that you um, can maintain salvation, but so that you can fall into salvation, so that you can become a part of the body. Without it, you wouldn't have called on Him. You would have remained dead in your sins and trespasses. But when you confessed your sin to the Lord and believed from the heart unto righteousness, you were being obedient unto the call of the gospel. So Paul says it this way in Romans 6, 17, But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. And lastly, there's a right view of love. A right view of love. And we could spend a lot of time on this. And what an, what an amazing man to understand love from is John. He's called the disciple whom Jesus loved. He's called the beloved apostle. Okay? Um, so it's wonderful to hear that from him. But without a right view of the love of God, you weren't going to be in the faith anyways. Because you understood that his sacrifice was not just to appease a wrathful God, but that his sacrifice was genuine and it was done out of, yes, obedience to the Father, but also, it says that this is a faithful saying, worthy of all expectation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to do what? To save sinners. Right? That is a kind of love that we can't comprehend. I mean, we, get, we, can, get our, we can get our minds around it, but we can't plunge the depths of that love. But we have to have a right view of love to be saved. But before we get to the three marks of a true believer, because we've, we've hit Jesus, then we're going to go to sin, obedience, and love. John introduces for us a whole other thing here. And this has literally um, been what has flooded my mind since the Saturday after our study. I hit this verse and I said, no, I'm going to skip this. And I couldn't get off of it. I could not get off of it. So we're going to look at that before we get to the other three marks. We're going to look at this subject, this whole new subject, and that is fellowship. Now, like the four marks of a believer, we may not have a full understanding of a fellowship when we're saved, but we have a general idea. But what I want to do tonight is to give you, is to help lay the foundation and, and give you a good picture of what our fellowship is so that we can both enjoy it and we can be in love with our fellowship and it's not just the word that we throw around flippantly and it's like, man, we're going to barbecue and come over and have fellowship with us. And we barbecue and we talk about work, talk about, you know, what's going on in life. And we talk about this and that, but we never bring up the Lord and we call that fellowship. Our fellowship and our communion is based upon not our commonality with the world, the things of the world, but our commonality with the gospel, with Jesus Christ. That is our fellowship. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's the goal of this lesson. I want you to understand and understand fellowship and by that be in love with fellowship. And it should no longer be a vague term to you, but it should be something you know and love. So let's look at 1 John 1 and verse number 3. Let's go ahead and read this. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly, truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Let's go ahead and pray real quick. I ask that you all pray for me as we go to the Lord. Lord, I want to thank You that You have revealed Yourself to us in Your Holy Scripture. 
And now, Lord, we ask you to help us understand some more of the depths of the meaning of this thing that you have placed us into, this fellowship. Lord God, I pray that you would help us to love this communion that we have one with another and with you and with your Son and with the Holy Ghost. God, we pray that you'd open our hearts and understanding to this now. And let us, Lord, be encouraged by it. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So, John introduces to us this concept of fellowship. And I want to note four things about fellowship. We're not going to get to all four. And you guys are like, my goodness, we are on verse number three. And we are on the third time we're meeting. If this pattern keeps up, we're going to have 102 more lessons. Amen. And that would be all right, but I want to deal with the the book in bigger chunks. I don't want to, I don't want to chase every rabbit, but I think this is necessary that we take hold of this. I think it'll be helpful and edifying. Um, so we're going to look at four things about fellowship. Number one, it's foundation. Number two, it's function. Number three, it's faults, not it's faults in the sense of, well, there's a problem with fellowship, but the things that are faults for fellowship that lead us to danger, uh, endangering our fellowship. And number three, the future of fellowship. And I'm just going to tell you right now, the foundation is where we're going to focus most of our time on this evening. And it's not something that's unfamiliar to you. It's quite obvious to most of us, I think, already that the foundation of our fellowship, but I think it's something that we need to give some attention to, because this is a part of what gives us full joy. Note this in verse 4, And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. And that joy is attached to your fellowship. And that fellowship is based upon something. And here's what it's based upon. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. What did John and the other apostles see and hear? They saw the person and they saw the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what they saw. Um, They saw the incarnate Son of God and they saw His manifest power as He healed, as He taught with wisdom and words that could not be overcome, as He instructed the Pharisees and the priests and the scribes and the Sadducees and all of these people as He laid them, I mean, He laid them out. He was Mike Tyson. Everything that they sent His way, He knocked out of the park. That is a bad analogy there. I went from boxing to baseball. Um, But you understand what I'm saying? Amen. It is all based upon the person and work of Jesus Christ. In other words, if you don't know the person and work of Jesus, and John went to great lengths to explain that to us in his gospel. And you can think about the epistle of John as kind of uh, a handbook that goes along with the gospel. And he explained the person of work in Christ. And if you do not know that person and work, then you don't qualify to have fellowship with the apostles and with the Father and with the Son and with the Spirit and with the saints. And that's what we want to be a part of. Not not some worldly fellowship, but we want to be a part of this gospel fellowship. So the world offers to us counterfeit fellowships. Has anybody been to a counterfeit fellowship that the world offers? They're called bars and bowling alleys, and they're called... um, They're called... uh, All kinds of things. I'm at a loss for words, but you know, they're called all kinds of things. And and the bar is a really good counterfeit for fellowship. And and the bowling alley is a really good counterfeit for fellowship. You shoot the breeze, you talk about things that you normally wouldn't talk about with people, and and you just, sometimes you bear out your heart because you've had a few brewskis and, and you know, everything, you know. And and so that's that's what it is. It's a counterfeit, though. And the devil wants to offer a counterfeit because he knows that we are creatures that are created for fellowship. That is the, that is the reason that we are created by God. Number one, for His glory. And He glorifies Himself in that He makes Himself close to His creation. And that is what, his, that is what the fellowship is about. In Genesis, it says, God formed the man of the dust of the ground. In chapter 2 and verse 18, it is not good that man should be alone. So the whole point of His creation, he, he has designed us for fellowship. Some of us are lacking fellowship right now. I mean, you're here, but you're not here. You're present, but you're not present. You don't have the fullness of your joy and your fellowship. 
And we'll go over a little bit of why that is. And a big part of why that is is because you don't have a right understanding of the foundation of your fellowship. You're disconnected because you somehow... And I don't mean this exactly the same way that the Apostle meant it when he writes in Revelation, but somehow you have left your first love. Maybe not to the extent that he's talking about there. Uh, to, who does he say that to? The Ephesians, I think? Maybe it's not that same extent or that same exact you know, context, but you've left your first love. You're disconnected from the gospel somehow. And, and I want to I lay this out for you so that we can get reconnected to that. So that that can be our foundation. So, um, God's created us, He's designed us for fellowship, and the highest level of fellowship is a fellowship with God. That is the highest level of fellowship. Adam fell, but God had a plan. Right? It's not plan B. It's not God's reaction to the fall of man. It is God's plan. It is God's will. It is God's purpose from the very beginning. Because He created man out of the dust of the ground, right? Right? So what kind of a creature are we? The Bible calls us an earthy creature. The Bible calls us uh, a carnal creature. It calls us mortal, right? It calls us all of those things. So we are not in a position, even in the garden, where we can have a complete fellowship with God. Because there is innocence, but there is opportunity for what? A fall. The angels have innocence, but there's an opportunity for what? Lucifer did what? He had pride, and he fell. So God wants to give us something. He wants to create a new kind of fellowship. So the fall is not just like when, when you're a kid. Who, how many of you said, man, if Adam just had not messed up, things would be so much better, right? They would be better than they are now, but they wouldn't be the best thing that they could be. You understand that? They would. It would be way better if we were still in innocence. We'd all be walking around naked, eating grapes and nuts, and life would be wonderful, right? We wouldn't know we were naked, but that's, I mean, I don't mean that lewdly, but I mean, that's what we would be. We would be in that innocent state where we did not even understand that sin was out there because where no law is, there is no sin. But God designed the fall for this purpose because He wanted to take that carnal man and develop, not develop, but create something new to bring that man to another level, another plane, not to deity, but to dine with deity. Not to um, His own glory, but to stand in the glory of the one who has redeemed Him. We couldn't have that if we were still in a state of innocence. God is creating a new thing. And that is the fellowship that we find in Jesus Christ. Okay. It's not a fellowship with angels or beasts, but with men. He's not restoring, but He is creating an entirely new level of fellowship. Isn't that good? Yes. Do you know that that fellowship, we're going to talk about the future of fellowship, but that fellowship is not... Post-mortem? That fellowship is not once our bodies laid in the ground. That fellowship is present and now. Now, and we're going to get to that here a little later. I don't want to spoil it for you. John says it this way. Um, it is the gospel. It is the cross. It is the person and work of Christ that gets us into that fellowship. John 20 and verse 31. He talks about the works, the signs, which are not written in this book. Right? He says, he says they would fill all of the books of the world, I think he says. Right? If you were to write everything that Jesus did in the depth, in the depth of it. Right? But he says, these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have what? Life. But what kind of life? A life that is through His Son. That life, I'm going, to, I'm going to contradict what a lot of us have heard and what I've even teached in the past. Teached. I teached it once. <laughs> My wife teaches English. <clears throat> I just use a bunch of random words and um, unubiquitous words, but she's the one who really knows how to use them. Um, 
The life is a life, note this, of unbroken fellowship with God. How many of you heard this? Oh, they're out of fellowship with God. You've heard that? How many of you said, I'm out of fellowship with God because of my sin? I'm going to prove to you that that's wrong. You might get mad because I'm not going to prove it this very second. But suffice it to say this for the moment. This is what he says. But as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God in John 1.12. You are a son and daughter of God when you have received the Lord Jesus Christ and you are established in the fellowship of the saints based upon your being in Christ. You see that? The gospel is not the end of the work of God, but he has ordained a fellowship of direct divine adoption. If you're taking notes, I want you to note that. This is a fellowship that is ordained in, by direct divine adoption. Janice has adopted. Do you know that you cannot give up an adopted child? There's no paperwork you can fill out to do that. Parents abandon their children all the time. But they will send you to jail, if I'm not mistaken, if you try and abandon the child you adopted. Now check me out on that. That may not be correct. But they probably should send you to jail if they don't. Think of this. The gospel is not the end of the work. It is the beginning of the work. Okay, In time past, Ephesians chapter 2 says this. In time past, we walked according to the course of this world. Okay, That's where our lives were, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we were, by nature, the children of wrath. But God, who is rich in mercy, for His great love wherewith He loved us, when we were dead, He's quickened us together with Christ. And He has raised us up together. Note that. And he hath, past tense, past tense. Note that. He hath raised us up together. That means it already happened. When you were born again, you were raised immediately up together and made to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now we've all heard this taught, but get the fullness of this. So in a very real sense, because he hath, past tense, raised us together, in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? That means that we are in an active, present, continuing, uninterrupted fellowship of the Father in our spirit through the Son. Or in the Spirit through the Son. The result of the work of Christ is a seat with Christ. And where does Christ sit? At the right hand of the Father. That is the result of the work of Christ. This is the foundation. You're not breaking fellowship with God. You may destroy joy of your fellowship, but you're not breaking it. You are still in fellowship with God, and what a wonderful truth. And if when we abuse that truth, and we deny it, and we malign it, we say that we are out of fellowship with God, we have made little of the cross, of what was accomplished at the cross. The question is not... If you're married, the question is not, am I married? The question is, do I have joy in my marriage? You don't wake up and say, well, my marriage is going poorly, so I'm out of marriage with my wife. Or I'm out of marriage with my husband. You say, I don't have any joy in my marriage. Or there's tension in my marriage. Or there's a fight going on in my marriage. But understand this, that God has ordained marriage to be a likeness of what is going on in this fellowship. That what God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Now, all images of this are not perfect. And that's not a perfect image. Because He gave a bill of divorcement, right? But there is no bill of divorcement from the Son once you have been placed under His blood. Do you see that? It's unbroken fellowship. Unbroken, unmitigated fellowship. That happens when we repent and believe the gospel. When we become sons and daughters of God, He cannot unadopt us. The circumcision made without hands. Do you know that you can't reverse the circumcision? You mothers who have had your children circumcised, you know you can't reverse that. Like, that, that's just what happens. And it's done. 
You cannot reverse the circumcision of the heart. You can't circumcise the heart and then put back that old thing. That's not possible. In Christ we are new creatures created in Christ Jesus unto good works. We can't leave that. We can't break that fellowship. Uh, There's much more that can be said about this foundation. But does that give you a good understanding? I mean, do you see that? You're not, you can't break fellowship with God. You can mess with the joy of that fellowship. You can mess with the fullness of that fellowship, but you can't leave it. You can't. And praise God for that. That's all established by Christ. We're adopted by God. And in that adoption, we're in constant, unbroken fellowship with Him by means of His Son's work on the cross. And this is a fellowship that John is both reminding the believers of in this epistle, and he's also inviting those who are not believers into it. The gospel call rings out. Do you understand that if we had a full, if we had a more full, I'm not a complete, but a more full understanding of what God has done when He's placed us in Christ Jesus and we are seated together in heavenly places in Christ, if we take hold of that, why would you dare walk past anybody that the Lord has pressed upon your heart to give the gospel to? Or why sometimes would you even wait for the Lord to convict you to share the gospel? Why? Do you not know what you possess? The riches of heaven are laid at your feet? We need to have a real sense of this. We need to have a real sense that the opposite of this fellowship is damnation. Why why do we fear men rather than fear God? Peter says, is it better to obey God or obey man? We don't even have to have someone say to us, oh, don't do that. We just don't do it. We're afraid of man. We don't even have to go before the the proconsul or or whoever it may be. We don't even have to have that that meeting there where the government says, don't you preach the gospel. Don't you tell people about Jesus. We're already fearful of men before we even open our mouths so that we keep them shut. We are not the lions in Daniel's den. We are supposed to be heralds for the king. You say, well, I just don't have that gift. But do you have the testimony? You don't have to have the gift of proclamation like a street preacher or like a Charles Lawson or, or, or like an Ed Ballou. You don't have to have that gift. You have to have a testimony. Note what we said again there back in Romans. You're not going to be ashamed of what Christ has done for you. Romans 1, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God and the salvation. It is not your work of, of, like, let me eloquently tell them my testimony, or let me eloquently tell them my gospel. You don't have to do anything eloquently. You just have to do it right. You say, well, I don't know how to do it right. Do you know how you got in? Did you learn to swim? Maybe you're not a great teacher, but I guarantee you can tell people how to do the doggy paddle. You may not be able to tell them, well, this is all you got to do after you learn to just keep yourself afloat. You may not be able to tell them how to breathe right and how not to gulp all the water down um, and all those kinds of things, but you're going to at least be able to tell them like the beginning steps. This is how you get in. This is how you get in. Do you have a testimony? All right. Praise the Lord. Do you share it? When's the last time? I'm going to, I'm going to try and let the Holy Spirit convict you with this. When is the last time you shared your testimony? Do you know that a part of the fullness of joy is your continued proclamation of your source of joy? When we get down and we don't tell people about the gospel, and we, what do we do? We, when we get down, we get depressed, we get overcome with things, and we want to go to people and we want to tell them about how bad the world is, and about how scary things are, and about how bad our day's been, and about how our life stinks, about how this person is offended, this person done that, and everything's not right. And you just get that spirit about you that I, I love. I love what um, the brother said. He said, it "Gives you that stink face, like, like that's the face you got." Mm. Life is bad. Rick Owen says all the time. He's like, "If you're saved, inform your face." There should be a 
a winsomeness about you, winsome, or there should be a brightness about you. There should be a joy in your life. Yes, God will break us sometimes, and He will put us in positions where He is molding us into the image of Christ. But even in those times when there are troubles and trials, we ought to have a desire to shout forth, in spite of these trials, these are things that are working in my life to conform me to the image of Christ, and I can still, in spite of that, not be ruled by my emotions, not be ruled by my feelings, but I can say, in Christ I am more than a conqueror. And I don't have to be controlled. Women struggle with this more than men. But some of us men struggle way more than it with way more with it than women. But for the majority, women struggle with this. And I would encourage you, ladies, don't let your feelings rule you. Men, don't let your feelings rule you. Let the truth of Scripture rule you. Let the one who left the throne of heaven to build one inside your heart rule what you do and say and feel and all those things. Take every thought that raises itself against the uh, knowledge of Christ into captivity. Cut it down. Lift up Christ. And I guarantee that if all of a sudden a proclamation of the gospel keeps coming out of your mouth, that joy will follow. For it is the gospel that is our foundation for our fellowship and for full joy. It's an exclusive fellowship, but it's not... It doesn't cut people off because the membership's been paid for. Don't forget that, believer. And don't forget to tell lost people about it. They need to get in. Okay, so that is our foundation. Does everybody understand that? Did I, did I weave through that well enough? The foundation is the gospel. If you're born again, you're in the fellowship of the saints. You're in the fellowship of the Father. You're in the fellowship of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Uh, Titus chapter 1 and verse 4. Um... Excuse me, 1 John 1 and verse 3, sorry. Um, truly, our fellowship is with who? The Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And don't forget the Holy Ghost. Here's the fellowship with the Holy Ghost. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 14. And grace... Uh, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God... And the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. Note that. That word communion is the same word that is translated as fellowship. Koinonia is communion. It is fellowship. And that's going to inform our next, um, our next point about fellowship. It's function. It is a communion. It is a commonness. Note this, and you don't have to go to these passages, but I'm just going to lay them out for you. Titus chapter 1 and verse 4. This is what Paul says to Titus, mine own son, after the common faith. The common faith. It is exclusive, as in you must be in it, or you're damned. But it is inclusive that there are there, there's nobody at this level and that level. It's the common faith. What Pastor Lawson say? The only level ground on earth is the ground that's at the cross. That's the flattest place on earth. When we all get there, we are all at the same level. Okay. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Uh, excuse me, this, this has got mixed up. Romans chapter 1 and 12. Paul's writing to the Romans. He says, that is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. The mutual faith. It is something we share together. There is a commonness. You all are here if you're born again because of the commonness of our faith. If you are not yet born again, we invite you to that commonness. Peter says it this way. I love this. This is my favorite expression about the faith. 2 Peter 1, verse 1, I think. No, it's not verse 1. Yeah, it is verse 1. 2 Peter 1, 1. Yeah. 
Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us. Because you worked diligently to make yourself righteous before God. Right? For those of you that have not turned there, I'm not reading out of a different translation. <clears throat> like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. You cannot be a part of the faith if your faith says what the Mormons say. For by grace are you saved through faith after all that you can do. That's what 2 Nephi says. That's a book in the, one of the books out of the Book of Mormon. Nephi was this angelic being and he was so wise and so just full of God and, you know, whichever God the Mormon chose at that time to be looking to. So full of the wisdom of Heavenly Father that he could inform the Apostle Paul to correct what he said in his epistle. For you are saved by grace through faith after all that you can do. If it's all that you can do, it is none of the righteousness of God and His Son, Jesus Christ. Do you think that God is willing to accept what you can do? By no means, God forbid, which is the strongest thing that you can say in the Greek language. God forbid it. Our commonness is not based upon our effort, but, a, uh, but upon His completed work. Your joy in that commonness, that fellowship, is based upon your effort, though. Our commonness is not based upon our effort, but the joy of that commonness, that fellowship, is based upon our effort. Not our effort to be righteous, but our effort to submit, to acknowledge our sin, to obey His command, and to love. That is what affects the joy of that fellowship, that commonness. Look at this with me real quick. I think we're going to get a lot farther than I expected. Praise the Lord. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 6. I want to go a little deeper into this point about really being in the fellowship. Now remember, there are four marks of the fellowship. Of being a true believer. Okay? What are they? They're right view of Jesus, right view of sin, right view of obedience, and right view of love. Okay? When we operate outside of a constant remembrance of the work of Christ on the cross, when we forsake communion, we are not in the fullness of the joy. A fellowship. You know how important communion is? How important it is to take that picture of the blood and body of Christ into ourselves? Like, we're scared of that as Baptists. Like, we do it, but we're scared of it. Like, our Presbyterian brothers are doing way better than us. You know what I mean? Like, I know Presbyterians or Reformed Baptists especially. What do they do? They have communion like every two weeks. And you say, man, that would just get boring. Uh, boring. boring. I'm going to learn to speak this year. I promise you. Y'all pray for me. Um, right? Every service. every service. Right? And that seems boring, right? Like, that's so repetitive. But if we take what, that scripture, what the Scriptures say about that, and we cling to that, and we say, man, this is representing... The body and blood of Jesus Christ, I am remembering the work that He did on the cross that puts the cross at the forefront of our mind all the time. But if we don't do that, if we don't take communion, we don't get to have that fullness of that sense of that realization of the work of Christ, that remembrance of the work of Christ. I want you to be honest with yourself. How many of you 
recite the gospel to yourself every day. Think about that. Don't say it out loud. But how many of you preach the gospel to yourself every day? You say, I'm not a preacher. I didn't say, are you getting up in front of people? I'm saying, are you telling yourself the gospel every day? We need the gospel. I mean, just because the gospel is not the end, that doesn't mean that we leave it behind. We have to constantly be preaching the gospel to ourselves to see what Christ has done and who we are outside of Christ and, and what He has given to us so richly that He has brought us into the fellowship of the Father and Himself and the Spirit and the saints. That we are seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus because of His work. Preach the gospel to yourselves every day. You want to purify your life? You feel like, man, I just keep stumbling in sin after sin after sin. And the joy of my fellowship is being stolen from me by my own action or inaction. Then what do you need to do? You need to preach the gospel to yourself. You need to be so gospel centered that every time that you think a thought that the first thing that comes to your mind is what Jesus has done for you. And that leads, guides and directs what you say, what you do. Men, when we are driven uh, or, or when we are drawn to pornography, that we preach the gospel to ourselves and we overcome that drawing because we think of Christ and what he has done to rescue us from that condemnation, from that damnation, from that hor horrendous uh, sin against even our own flesh. And we, we, women, when, when you are drawn to pornography, when you are drawn to whatever it is that, that, that God has... Um, that, that by, by design of your body that, that you run to that. Sometimes what women do is they're not looking for pornography, but they're looking for a man who will be that gentle one, who will listen to them and who will just hear their voice and, and, and not give them an immediate response. Women don't want a response. They don't come to you and ask a question looking for an answer. They come to you and ask a question looking for you to just listen and say, yes, I know that's terrible. See, men, when we, when we want to vent about something, we tell someone about something that's going on, we want them to tell us how to fix it. Women don't want you to tell them how to fix it. They want you to listen to their problem and have sympathy and come alongside them. Man, that flies right in the face of everything that we know as men. But when women go and look for a man who will do that for a short period of time, he'll do it for a short period of time until he can get what he wants. Uh, he'll make himself available to you emotionally until the physicality comes. When that, uh, when that kind of thing is presented in your eyes, that you preach the gospel to yourself and you say, Christ, you have made me and I'm made a new creature in Christ by the work that he has accomplished and I don't have to go to that. You want to stay away from sin? Preach the gospel to yourself. You want to have fullness of joy in your fellowship? Preach the gospel to yourself. You say, well, you're, you're just kind of a one-answer man. It's the gospel to everything, right? That's, that's the answer. It's true. That's it. It is the foundation of fellowship. And the whole point that God has done with creation, He's tried to take what? Man from a state of innocence to a state of condemnation for sin into a state of a new fellowship. You see that, right? Remember that? It is a work of God to draw us into something new. Are you there? Are you there and you don't have the joy? Maybe there's some purging that needs to take place. There's some things that you need to get rid of. There's some truths that you need to take hold of and preach to yourself time and time again. Because He doesn't want us to just have be in the fellowship. He doesn't want us to just be married but not have a good, loving relationship with our spouse. He wants us to love each other rightly. He wants husbands to love their wives as Christ loved His church and gave Himself for it, right? And He wants wives to submit to their own husbands, right? Why? Because that is the order that He has set creation in. He wants that because that is good for fellowship. Because husbands, when you realize that a godly wife will submit herself to you, right? You realize that she's going to do it because you're being like the godly man that Christ has called you to be. And then you're going to see that, oh, I'm the bride of Christ. Yeah. And so if He's calling my wife, to submit herself to me. He's calling me to submit myself to Him. And we don't submit ourselves to Him by taking on great learned teachers. 
But we do as the Bereans and we try everything that everybody says against the Scriptures. We measure it by the Word of God. We take what men say and we take it to the Scriptures and we say, does this line up? Yes, it does. Amen. We don't get spoon fed, just slop all the time. And, it, you know, I've realized that people who do not study their Bibles fall into heresy a lot quicker than people who do study their Bibles. Right? I mean, it just makes sense. It just makes sense. And it's not always damnable heresies. But it's heresies that steal the joy of fellowship. We're going to bring back to fellowship the whole night. For the next three hours, it'll be back to fellowship. Okay. I mean, I'm sorry, not three hours. This is going to be quick no matter how long it takes, I promise. Think about it. Think about this. 1 John 1, 6. We're finally going to get to it. I told you to turn there a few minutes ago. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light... Now, hold, hold on there. If we walk in the light, what does that mean? What does it mean to be in the light? Okay. That's, that's, that's a very common understanding of that. I'm, I'm going to argue this, that walking in the light is the new birth. Some people say that it is talking about the times when we are not living in sin and we're walking in the Spirit, right? And that's a common understanding of this. But I don't think the passage, the text bears that out. Note this, here's what it says. If we walk in the light... Let me, let me restate it this way, just so you kind of get an understanding. When we read it that way, where it's, where it's us walking in the Spirit, right? But if we walk in the Spirit, not sinning, because when we're walking in the Spirit, we're not sinning, right? We have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. So, but if we're walking in the Spirit, which is, means not sinning, what is there to cleanse? What 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 do you need cleansing from if, if walking in the spirit or walking in the light is you walking in a right relationship with God with no unconfessed sin? If you read it that way, then this is this is confusing. It's con it confuses what the passage is saying. That makes our cleansing conditional on whether or not we are. Not sinning. Do you see that? If we walk in the light, or if the light means close fellowship with the Lord, walking in the Spirit, not sinning, if we walk not sinning as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and our sins are cleansed. But what sins do we need to have cleansed if walking in the light means that we're not sinning? Walking in the light is salvation. I don't care if you are crawling on your face. You are moving when you're born again. Now you may be sliding across the gravel or a desert place on your face, dragging yourself by your fingernails, but you are moving. We go from faith to faith whether we want to or not. We are growing whether we want to or not. Sometimes that growth is painful because we're on our face crawling through the gravel or whatever. But we are growing. You will not be less mature tomorrow than you were today. You may do things that are less mature, but you are more accountable because you have gained more knowledge and you are not less mature. You are just behaving like a fool. Do you see that? There's a whole big psychology thing about children regressing. Oh, my kids regressed. All of a sudden, my eight-year-old is like a two-year-old again. No, your eight-year-old is being rebellious. He has not regressed. He has taken the maturity that he has gained, and he has said, damned it all. That's what he said. He said, forget all of it. I don't care about anything that I've learned. I want to do what I want to do. And he goes back to the terrible twos. It's not that they've regressed. It's that they've taken what they've learned and they've said, forget it. 
you're constantly growing. Question is, is in that maturing, are you expressing the maturing of your knowledge, of your understanding? Or are you being as a fool and you're letting it just go off to the wayside? Are you applying what you're learning, in other words? How many times have you sat under a preacher who said the same thing that you've heard a thousand times before and all of a sudden it clicked? And you're like, oh man, I'm going to fix that. It doesn't mean that you didn't hear it all those times before. It just meant that you were being really immature with the information that you had. And then when you stumble and sin over that same issue, it's not that you have regressed. It's that you have stumbled unto sin. And now you need to do what? Confess it and forsake it. That's a part of the function of fellowship is to put us in a position where we know the foundation, and now, in other words, the foundation is practical. Uh, Not practical, positional. The foundation is positional. You are in unbroken fellowship with the Father, you can't change that. That is the position that you are in, because you are in Christ. You're in the body of Christ, you can't change that. We don't lop off fingers and arms and whatever else, right? Right? Like, you're a part of the body, you're a part of the body. There's no escaping it. We're not doing any amputations. You're just there. You may not be using your gifts to the full effectiveness to edify the body and to glorify the Lord, but you're still there. Some of us feel like we're the pinky toe and we have no function, or we, we're like the, what, what is the thing that they can remove? It's a vestigial an organ, an appendix, yeah. They call it a vestigial organ, like you don't really need it. I mean, you do, but you don't have to have it, right? Some people think you're the appendix, and you're like, well, I mean, it does have a function, but it's not absolutely necessary. So, you know, that's how you feel, but you're not that. Everyone is gifted. You may be ignorant of what your gift is, but you're gifted, and God has given you a purpose in the body of Christ. You're not placed here, and God's ignorant, like, well, I mean, just find your seat. You know, figure out where you belong. I mean, you got to figure out where you belong, but God has gifted you and you need to use that. Why? To edify the body? If you have a gift and you're not using it, then you're stealing glory from God and you're hindering the fellowship of the saints. If you can write poetry and you're not writing poetry for the glory of God, you're hindering God's glorification and you're hindering the edification of the saints. Imagine if Fanny Crosby said, you know, I can really write some music, but just forget that. You know, there are people in history that have done that. I've got this gift, but I'm just not going to use it for God's glory. And so we've missed out on so much. Why? Because of laziness in the body of Christ. Positionally, we are in the Father. Positionally, we are in the Son. The Son is in us. Positionally, the Holy Spirit is in us. We're seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's unchanging. But practically, we're not always in fellowship. In other words, what I mean is we don't always engage in the fellowship of the body of the saints like we should. I'm not patting you all on the back, but this is so encouraging for me to see you all here. I love my church. Every last one of you. I love my church. I don't love just the members that don't give me grief. I don't love just the people there who don't annoy me. I love the people even who frustrate me to no ends, have me grinding my teeth in prayer at 3 o'clock in the morning as I say, God, would you just hit them over the head with a red back hymnal? (laughs) I love every last one of the people in that congregation. I may not know them individually and closely and intimately, but I love them. I don't love them for Christ's sake. I love them because they are in the body of Christ. They are members of the same body as me. And I want their good. And when I see you all here, I see that you all want good for the body of Christ. 
Some of you think you're here selfishly just to say, I need this, I need this, I need this. But do you realize how much of an encouragement you are to the other people that are here? Now, for those of you who do not like big crowds, you may be a little bit of a discouragement to them. But on the whole, you're an encouragement. That was a joke. You're an encouragement. I mean that. You encourage me and my wife. Not just to clean the house and get it tidy for when you all come. I mean, but you encourage us in the Lord. The fellowship that we have had after these Bible studies has been instrumental in my growth and my maturing and my loving the saints more and seeing your all's needs and being able to dive into prayer and say, Lord, I need you now to help me to pray rightly for this saint. God, that you would lift them up out of the pit that they're in. Lord, that you would use their joy over the gospel to help glorify and, and magnify your name. What, whatever end of the spectrum you're on, whether you're in the pit or you're on the mountaintop, it, this has informed my prayer life. This has also informed my understanding of God. Because as we bear one another's burdens, as I bear your burdens and you bear mine, it has informed the, my understanding of how God has knit us together in a fellowship. Think about this. This is the function of fellowship. When you're a baby, the Bible says what that He does what to you in your mother's womb? Knits you together. Think about that. In eternity past, God ordained that there would be a body of Christ and in an eternity past, he knit those believers who had come to faith in Christ together as one body. And we were birthed in the book of Acts when the church was born. As we place our faith in Christ and we are filled with the Holy Spirit and we are something new in Christ Jesus, he knits us together. We are one. But practically, we're not all one, right? This is the function. The function is to distinguish those who are really in the body and those who are really out of the body. The function of the body is to discern. It's to, not to weed out every single tear, but to discern and say, yeah, this is what places you in the body of Christ and this is what leaves you out. And so when we find somebody and we think, oh, they might be out of the body of Christ, we go to God in prayer for them and we seek God's wisdom on how to minister to them the gospel. And then, on the other hand, when we see somebody who we, we trust, they have a good testimony, and they have given their life to the Lord, and there's been evidence in their life, but now they are stumbling, we go to God and we say, God, help me to lift them up before Jesus Christ properly, and not to look at them and say, well, not to just say, God, I'm glad I'm not there, because amen, glad we're not there, right? When, we're, when someone's down in the pit, or someone's off in sin, Maybe someone's not even off in sin, but they're just down in despair. Like, thank God I'm not there right now. But it doesn't stop there. We have a heart of prayer for that person because we are knit together as one body. The function of the body is to help bring us to full joy. The function of the body is to help bring us to a closer understanding of Christ's work in His creation. If you don't like going to church... I'm preaching to the choir here for just a second. If you don't like going to church, there may be a symptom in your heart that says that that's pointing to the fact that maybe you're not a part of that body because if you don't can two walk together unless they agree? If you can't find a church to fellowship with, I like the way that I've heard it said in the past if every job you go to is the problem, you're the problem. If every church you go to is the problem, you're the problem. We need to have patience with the saints. Now, we do not need to abandon sound doctrine, but we need to have patience with the saints who we have discerned are in light. What is being in light? According to Caleb, anyways? Being saved. I have to say according to the Scriptures. But note this. The body 
is designed, the function of the body is designed to bring us to full joy. How many of you have had more joy because of this Bible study rather than less? I mean, I have. I'm excited. I'm so excited, I'm sweating. It's just a little warm in here, too. Um, I'm thankful for this. Because you all are members of one body with me. The function of the body is to do what? Is to perform the work of God here in time. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, ordained unto good works. No, what does it say? Somebody help me out here. Do I have that one in my notes? No, I did. I took it out. It's in Ephesians 2. We are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which He hath before ordained that we should walk therein. Thank you, Lord. He's ordained us to walk in something, but He did not set us to walk alone. This is the practical function of fellowship. We need to get close. Do you know that we need to be so close that we can rebuke each other? That's practical, functional fellowship. We should be so close that I can walk up to you and unashamedly rebuke you. Now, not mean and nasty, but in love, right? I should be able to tell you, you are acting a fool. Okay? I should be able to tell you, you are stumbling in this sin and I see it. It's apparent. And I love you and I, I want you to know that you need to come out of this. The function of the body is to give us a place of confession. Not to a priest. Not, not to some elevated man. Not to some vicar of Christ. But that we have a function of confessing one to another. We'll get to that here later. We'll, we'll dive deeper into that. As, as John says that, uh, that we confess our faults one to another. Why do we do that? Confession is good for the soul. Yes, it is, but that's so shallow. We do that because the function of the body, the function of practical fellowship, the practicalness of fellowship, is the cleansing of the bride. The function is that we are knit together. We are members of one body. We are to love each other. We are to display our gifts amongst each other, to edify each other. But we are also to correct each other. If you don't have a correctable spirit, you need to change that now. Do you know that a part, a function of this fellowship is that we get so integrated into our each other's lives? I mean, we're not with each other on a daily basis, but that we share things with each other. We confess things. We, we did that the other night. What a blessedness that was, too. To be able to confess, like, this is my fault. Like, I'm stumbling here. I mean, I don't, I, you don't have to share the secret things. Because there's a danger in confessing certain things to the public. But there are things that we can confess to another, one to another. You don't confess every single sin. But the things that you know that you struggle with, that you need someone to be there as a partner with you to pray over this issue, give those things to the church. We have weakened the church in that it is a building that we go to and not a body that we are a part of. I promise I'm getting ready to close. There was an old black preacher and he said, you know, I love, he would sing when he preached. And he said, I'm getting ready to close. <laughs> getting ready to close. <laughs> and there was a young boy in the congregation. He said, how many doors are in this sermon? <laughs> I am getting ready to close. <clears throat> the practical function of the body is to bring us to a purified state. Not, not perfect purification, but to purify us through the fact that we 
are integrated in each other's lives. The world has turned the church into this thing that was so knit together and it has pulled us apart. And through traditions of men, we have been taught that the church is a building. It is not a body, but that is a lie. It's a heresy. We need to hate that. Now, we don't have to be perfect in that. I, I like to say we go into the church house. Or we're going to meet with the church. I'm going to be with the church. Yeah, you don't have to be dogmatic about that, but you can't let that understanding rule your mind that the church is Temple Baptist, 2100 Woodrow Drive, Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock for Sunday school, 11 o'clock for worship surfing, 6 o'clock for evening service on Sundays, uh, 7 o'clock on Wednesday night. That is the church. No, it's not. This is the church. Amen. Wherever the saints are gathered is the church. And one of the main functions of the church is to keep itself pure. The Lord has cleansed us. Note this in 1 John 1, nine: If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, if this is what we have to do as saints, um, if this is a, is a, a salvation passage, and I think that it mostly is a salvation passage, how much unrighteousness do we get cleansed of? All. And do you know that it says this, cleanseth, or excuse me, that word cleanse there is in the perfect tense, or excuse me, the present tense. In other words, it's an action that starts and continues on. There's a continual cleansing of Jesus of his body, which keeps us from breaking that fellowship. Right? And on top of that, on top of that cleansing, we are to cleanse ourselves. Right? He, he says that if you, if you have this hope in you, that you purify yourself, even as the Lord is pure. And we need accountability for that. I'm not telling everybody tonight to confess a bunch of sins. But I'm saying that if there's something weighing heavy on your soul and you need the body to keep you accountable, God has so ordained it for that purpose. The function of the fellowship is for us to display our gifts, to manifest those gifts for the glory of God, edification of the brethren, and then for cleansing. It is the place we hear the word of God. And the Lord said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. We need to have a real fellowship, saints. Now I'm not saying we don't at temple. But I'm saying that we need to move onto a fuller fellowship. And I'm so glad that you have decided to take that step into that direction and that journey with this little portion of that great body that meets at Woodrow. I've got a lot more here that I could say, but let's let's go ahead and close now. And we'll we'll pick up next week with the faults or the dangers of fellowship and then the future of fellowship. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have opened your word to us. Lord, I pray that our hearts have been open to it. Father, we're grateful that you have placed us into the fellowship of your Son and the saints. Lord, I pray that you would take this word now and use it to the edification. Let it embolden us to be more active with your body. Lord, not that we are active out of a sense of duty, but we are active out of a sense of joy in our commonness, our community, our fellowship. Father, bless the rest of this time now this evening, Lord. Um, I pray that we would use it to speak about spiritual things. And that is true fellowship, when we can talk about spiritual things. Father, I pray that you would bless now every home and heart represented here. God, that we would be encouraged by your word to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in your work knowing that our labor is not in vain. For the mothers, their labor with their children is not in vain. Husbands, our labor with our wives is not in vain.
single saints that our labor as we serve Christ in our singleness is not in vain. But God, that you are using all of it to work out a greater glory for yourself and goodness for us in Christ Jesus. And it's through him that we pray. Amen.